Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. We're in 1 John chapter 2, getting ready to go into chapter 3. And knowing that there's no chapter divisions in the original manuscripts, I'm going to begin at 1 John 2, 29. And I'm going to read through the ninth verse of uh, chapter 3, or read to the ninth verse of chapter 3 since I believe this to be a connected segment. 29. If ye know that he is righteous, ye know that everyone that doeth righteousness is born of him. Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And every man that has this hope in him purifies himself, even as he is pure. Whosoever committeth sin transgresses also the law, for sin is the transgression of of the law and you know that he was manifested to take away our sins and in him is no sin whosoever abideth in him sinneth not whosoever sinneth hath not seen neither known him little children let no man deceive you he that doeth righteousness is righteous, even as he is righteous. He that committeth sin is of the devil, for the devil sinneth from the beginning. For this purpose the Son of God was manifest, that he might destroy the works of the devil. Verse 9, Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin, for his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin, because he is born of God. The NIV reads, No one who is born of God will continue to sin, because God's seed remains in him, and he cannot go on sinning because he has been born of God. The New English Standard Version, uh, I'm going to read from it. No one born of God makes a practice of sinning, for God's seed abides in him, and he cannot keep on sinning because he can't keep on sinning because he has been born of God. And I'm going to depart from the majority position. And I want to warn you again that it should be clearly understood by everyone listening that you need to search the scriptures carefully to see whether or not I'm right or I'm wrong in the way that I interpret these passages. because I take a slightly different position on this group of verses that's than what's normally taken. There's a great tendency to look at these uh, wonderful verses and translate them in the light of personal experience. If you know the text says, if you know, and that's, that's a perfect tense, that he is righteous, you know that everyone that does righteousness has been born of him. The word does there is poia, <clears throat> pardon me, it's poieo, okay, to do, okay. Uh, personal experience says in verse 29 that sometimes you, you do righteousness and sometimes you don't do righteousness having been born of him that is a perfect passive the perfect tense says it was done in past time and we're looking at the continuing reality of that completed action 
And the passive voice says that you didn't do it. You did not do it. That it was done to you. And yet, most of the people that you know carry the view that God, as our Heavenly Father, unlike Adam, okay, by the way, who passed his corrupt seed, you know, on to all mankind, he was able to father a child who sometimes does righteousness and sometimes doesn't. You know, is that, and that apparently, well, the spirit, the spiritual DNA or the spiritual genes, whatever you want to call it, got mixed up in there somehow. Okay. Even though, you know, that can't be any of God's DNA or whatever term you, you want to use. So personal experience tells us that most of the time we don't do righteousness. That's what personal experience tells us. Therefore, that verse can't mean what it appears to say. You know, what it says is, it says that one whom God has fathered does righteousness because God is righteous and he couldn't father anything else just like Adam couldn't father anything other than what he did. Uh, do you get that? The, the culmination of verse 29 is reached in the ninth verse of the third chapter. Reading in the Greek, whosoever is born of God, that the word whosoever is pos, meaning all, all having been born, perfect tense, okay, you've got a perfect tense there, out of the God, sin not, sin not. The reason it's translated whosoever there is because the sin is a singular. He does not commit sin. He does not commit sin for the seed of him remains in him and he has no ability. He has no power to continue presently. It's a present tense. Presently sin. Because, because, and here's the reason, because out of God, he has been perfectly passively born, okay? So we're looking at the present reality of a fast and quick, whenever it happens, I mean, it's this, I don't know when, the moment you were born again, like the big bang, but you received him and you were born not of blood, not of race, not, not because, you know, you're a Jew or a Gentile. You come from a good family, a bad family, you know, nor of the flesh, nor of the will of the flesh, the mind's own will, so-called free will, not because of anything that you did or I did, you know, not, we didn't, you know, like repent, receive, accept, not because of anything, not, not born by the will of man not by any minister, not by any missionary or anybody else, but by the will of God. And those who received him did it because, yes, okay, yes, it's a passive voice. They had been born. It's an aorist passive in this case. But they had been born by the will of God, not by their will, not by their own decision. And they have a father who is absolutely, get this, righteous. And you would expect, dearly beloved, you would expect that the offspring would, that they would be absolutely righteous. And in fact, well, that's, that's what they are. John 5, 21. For as the father raises up the dead and quickens them, even so the son quickens whom he will. So the son gives life to whom he will. He's the one that gives it. John 6, 63, it is the spirit that quickens, the flesh profits nothing. Romans 7, 17, now then it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwells in me. James 1, 18, of his own will, beget, it couldn't even be, couldn't be clear, of his own will begat he us with the word of truth that we should be a kind of first fruits of his 
creatures. You gonna tell me that some of that fruit is rotten? First Peter 1 Peter 1.23, being born again, in the Greek, having been born again, perfect passive, another perfect passive, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. No wonder we live and abide forever. Perfect passive, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which lives and abides forever. No wonder they cannot sin. No wonder your new man cannot sin, because it was born of incorruptible seed, dearly beloved. We are looking at a birth process. Lord, teach us to pray. Well, when you pray, say, Our Father. First thing, first thing you say, Our Father. The first thing that ought to enter your mind is that your Father is the one by whom you were born. That's what a father is. I don't, I don't know what goes through the minds of most people, but when I say father, I, I think that means just what it means. It means one by whom I was born. And we are looking at being born of incorruptible seed, not the corrupt seed of our earthly fathers, not the corrupt seed of Adam. We're out of Adam into Christ. Which, which gave rise for the need to be born of God's incorruptible seed. Those of you who have followed, if, if you remember back in Ephesians chapter 4, and that you put on the new man, there is our first reference to a new man, and that you put on the new man, which after God, after God, is created in righteousness, and true holiness. And it, it is no longer I that sin, but sin that dwells in me. You've put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. I've taken off the old man and put on the new man. Back to the 29th verse. If you know that is intellectual, if you are absolutely certain, perfect tense, and you do, you absolutely know that God is righteous. If you know that, then you know that everyone that does the righteousness has already been, already been born of God. Already been born of, of, of him. They're not born by doing any righteousness. They do righteousness because they're born of God. New man. But do we take that position when we look at our own lives? No, no, no. It's more like, well, you know, every once in a while we do righteousness. You know, but most of the time we don't or vice versa. And bear in mind, we don't come to these verses with the ridiculous assertion that, that we don't commit sin. Nobody here is saying on this channel that we don't sin, okay? We have two distinct separate natures, however, one which always sins and one which cannot, okay? 1 John 3, 7, little children, let no man deceive you. He that does righteousness is already righteous. How righteous? How righteous? Is he, is he only righteous? When he does righteousness and then when he he, he does unrighteousness when he's, he doesn't do righteousness well now he's no longer righteous is that what you're is that what you're gonna say are we to vacillate between being righteous and unrighteous i mean what are we phasing in and out of of, of righteousness as though it's a it's a hazy subject that maybe eventually you know well we'll finally become righteous you know if we work really hard at it but but now we're only partially righteous a good tree can only bring forth good fruit christ didn't say he didn't say well that most of the time the good tree brought forth good fruit that that isn't what he said 
that every once in a while, you know, well, there, you know, there was a rotten apple there. Like, well, you know, worms came in, you know, and, and a good apple became a bad apple. When my Lord said a good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, that is your new man. And he that commits sin is of the devil, for the devil sins from the beginning. Okay? Old man. Satan, it comes into the picture. Now it's old man. He that's, that, he that's born of God does not commit sin. So you're telling me that if you do commit sin, you're born of the devil? Well, you know, now i got a real problem. You, you have me born of the devil in one verse. And in the next verse, I'm born of God. What, where we, we suddenly vacillate back to being you know, of the devil? I, I'm, I can't do that. I can't. I'm sorry. I can't do that. If you want to translate this practice, okay, translate it practice. The, the word is not practice, but it's, it's do. But no, don't you see what you've done? You've taken something that's born of incorruptible seed and you've made it corruptible. His seed remains in him. And he absolutely has no power to sin. That, to me, that sounds like a good tree that only brings forth good fruit. That sounds to me like new wine and new wineskin. That sounds to me like a new man. I sin, but it's not I, says Paul, who sins, but sin that dwells in me, Romans chapter 7. I believe categorically the word of God declares that that which is born of God absolutely has no ability, no power whatsoever to sin. And we have many passages of Scripture that deal with the righteousness of God. If you, if you know that he's righteous, you know that everyone that doeth righteousness is born of him. When we speak of righteousness... We are speaking of the righteousness of you or God. You, you see, the problem with Christians in the main today is that in, they have a sick obsession with sin in, in the lives of others, for one thing. You know, not so much on themselves, but you know, they do pick on themselves. They beat up on themselves as well. But what, are you, you going to take, folks, are you going to take the book of Psalms out of circulation because David sinned? Or, or how about the epistles? We're just going to write off all 13 epistles because Paul sinned? The, the point I'm trying to make here is that people are, 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 are an old man and a new man. Everybody's old man brings forth evil fruit. Proso means to practice at doing something. But that's not the word here. It's do. And so we look at this righteous, you know, what is doing righteousness? Well, he gave money to the poor. All right. He gave money to the poor. Or he prays. He prays a lot. Or if you want real righteousness, you know, it's, it's, got, it's going to church on Wednesday night. Righteousness here is the result of being made the righteousness of God in Christ. Yet we want to we want to put the cart before the horse. You know that guy, that guy gave a hundred thousand dollars to the church. So man, he's really righteous. You know the child of God born from above a minute ago is absolutely fully righteous. Dearly beloved, you're called a saint. If you're in Christ, you're a saint because you've been born of God. You've been born of, the he of our heavenly Father who is sinless. The sinless new man can do nothing but righteousness. The, our Father passed that nature along to us, and every Christian owns that marvelous truth, every single one, even if they never, ever realize it. What if some do not believe? Shall their unbelief make the faithfulness of God without an effect impossible? Okay? 
the Corinthians. I mean, you know, the, the, the people at Corinth were terrible. You know, the scriptures even say that they were having activities in their church that aren't, aren't, weren't even named among the pagans. So it was a motley group, okay? And instead of lambasting them, okay, Paul writes, I thank my God always on your behalf for the grace of God which is given you by Jesus Christ that in everything ye are enriched by him in all utterance and in all knowledge, even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you, so that ye come behind, you're not lacking in, any spiritual grace, says the Greek, waiting for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall also confirm you unto the end that you may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful. God is faithful by whom you were called unto the fellowship of his son, Jesus Christ our Lord. And of course, we would find at the end of the chapter, verse 30, highlight this, but of him are ye in. Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us wisdom and righteousness. There's your new man that we're, we're looking at here in chapter 3 of 1 John. And sanctification and redemption. Why didn't he scold them to, to clean up their old man? Okay, why, did, why didn't he do that? Because he realized that they had a sinless new man, not only born again by incorruptible seed, by God above, as did the Apostle John, he wasn't about to place them under law. We think of righteousness in human terms, but now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. That The Old T Testament, the Old Testament foretold of it, even the righteousness of God, which is, and here it is, by Christ's faithfulness. Okay, the genitives in that verse show it is a possession of Christ. It's his faithfulness unto all and upon all them that believe. So there's no difference. You were made the righteousness of God in Christ. You didn't make yourself righteous. All righteousness is of the Lord. There's none righteous, no, not one. All our righteousness are his filthy rags. That's the righteousness we're talking about. Abraham believed God. It was counted unto him for righteousness. Verse, verse, just verse after verse. It's all tied together. If Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. How about, you know, for they being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness, they have not submitted, okay, submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. It isn't working hard. Okay, folks, it is submitting. God isn't righteous. Listen, God is not righteous because he does anything, because he does righteousness. I mean, God is not, isn't righteous because he does anything or because he doesn't do anything. He isn't righteous because he doesn't sin. He isn't righteous because of anything he does. He's righteous because of Jesus Christ, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God. Romans chapter 3. I don't know how to say this enough. 
If what Christ did, if what Jesus Christ did is not enough, God is not righteous. If you know that, that God is righteous, then you know that his work was sufficient. You can't add anything to it. I stand before God righteous in, in his sight because of what Christ did. If you are intellectually aware, if you are intellectually able to understand what God did in Christ, then you know he's righteous. Don't, don't read that and just say, well, you know, yeah, okay, yeah, I know he's righteous. Steve, I know he's righteous. Of course, he's God. He couldn't do anything wrong. You know, he, he must be righteous. Not what the verse is saying. What the verse is saying is you have intellectually comprehended what the sovereign majesty of eternity did when Jesus Christ came to die in your place. And, it, and that it was so completely done that there's nothing left to do. And you're dead to sin because Jesus Christ died in your place. You were crucified with him. God is righteous because Jesus Christ paid the penalty. Dearly beloved, are you aware that God's righteousness is based on the faithfulness of Jesus Christ. God's righteousness. If the faithfulness of Jesus Christ is sufficient to establish God's righteousness, please, dearly beloved, please, okay, what do you think it does for you? The fact that that you do righteousness is based upon your being born of him. Your being born of him is not based on your doing righteousness. Don't turn it around. Don't turn it around. He that hears my words and believes on him that sent me already has, go read it, everlasting life and has already passed from, go read it, death to life. Don't miss that passage. Has been born from God. So these are those who were born by the will of God, and they do righteousness. And what is the basis of God's righteousness? The faithfulness of Jesus Christ. What is the basis of your righteousness? the faithfulness of Jesus Christ. There isn't any difference. There's no difference. That which establishes the righteousness of God is that which establishes your righteousness and my righteousness. We're told to, to set our affection on things above where Christ sits on the right hand of God. Well, what are the things above? What are those things? You know, big horse ranches, you know, streets of gold. I'm not putting down the, any gold in heaven, okay? I'm not a, a Harley Davidson's, I, you know, what, whatever. I've had ministers say that the things above are anything you might want when you're in glory. Anything you want, okay? I believe the Lord will fulfill our, our heart's desire in many ways. And, but I've had kids tell me the things above, well, that's my dog. Dearly beloved, the things above is the righteousness of God in Christ, whose work was sufficient, who was a, who was get which was given to you as a gift, and which you can't add anything to. The same thing that establishes your righteousness is what established the righteousness of God in the first place. That's how David could be a man after God's own heart. You know it. it it is Christ who was set forth to display the righteousness of God, and it is Christ who displays your righteousness. And who shall lay any charge against? God's elect. It's God that justifies. Who is he that condemns? It is Christ that died. Okay? But don't end the verse there. 
and rose again, okay, rose again. The fact that he rose is the testimony that we rejoice in that what he did was sufficient, okay? If you don't believe that his work was sufficient, why, why celebrate Easter? He rose from the dead. That his raising from the dead is the evidence that the price that he paid, dearly beloved, was sufficient. I love you all. I truly do. Until next time, be safe, rest in him, and thanks for watching.